Jelobani, Ninga Tulum Tulo, Wetu, La Poso, Sangana Conagos of the Lavant. Jelobani, Ninga Tulum Tulo, Wetu, La Poso, Sangana Conagos of the Lavant. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Without any delay, I'm going to hand you over to Roots Reggae and Writing. This is facilitated by the amazing Chris Abani. In session is the um, OK Kwame Dawes and the not so cool Colin Channer. I was paid to do that. <laughs> Chris Abani, Kwame does. <laughs> Revolution. Every Friday after taking tea at four o'clock, St. William Rawl would drive downhill in his blue Fort Fairland dressed in a crushed white suit. Tall and thin, with a belly gone to pot, he'd flunked out of Cambridge before the war and had returned to St. Carlos to discover that fate had changed his fortune. A blight had swept the island and the family's coconut wealth was gone, which meant he had to work. With a high school education and a letter from the bishop and the commissioner of police, he was appointed headmaster of an all-girls school, a position that he kept until a book by Graham Greene convinced him that he was a man of letters. Since that revelation, he'd published 30 books, a volume for each year, 30 novels, six books of verse, nine books of science, a natural history of the island, a translation, of the New Testament to the local dialect and a primer on etiquette for women, all at his own expense. He'd been married four times, all of them to Rebecca Salan, the daughter of the island's richest Arab merchant, and she died beside him in her sleep five years ago in 1971 while he asked the Lord to take him in her place. But to anyone who offered him condolences, St. William would reply that he was not bereaved because Rebecca came to him at night in dreams with answers from the other world. Every Friday evening at 10 to 5, St. William would sit on a folding chair below the statue of Admiral Nelson and face a public building at three corners of the square and have a drink while shouting, the leader of the country is a bloody ignoramus and he must resign. And he would do this while looking at the clock, which had never rung since 1802. And so it was on the morning that St. William heard it chiming for the first time in his life. He sat up in his poster bed and made a quick decision. For the last eight months, his wife had been appearing in his dreams in army greens, her eyes replaced by watches. And so it was at the age of 65 when he should have been gazing at retirement from public life and St. William Rawl decided that history had invited him to start a revolution. He lived alone in the Metropolitan Hotel, which everyone still knew as Mount Pleasant, a plantation house and 1,500 blighted acres that hadn't seen a guest in three years. The floor planks were damp and the rafters draped with spider webs and the new extension that created what was advertised as modern relaxation by the pool had all the style and polish of the Bates Motel. St. William stood at his dresser. The top of it was inlaid with mother of pearl and littered with old books. I should have done this a long time ago, he thought. Estrella. By the time the footballs had arrived outside the door, he was dressed in a khaki shirt, a baseball cap, and knee-length water boots. From his double holster hung a pair of silver-plated pistols that had once belonged to his grandfather, and slung across his shoulder was a, a bolt-action rifle with a wooden barrel and a clip that held six lugs. His silver hair was parted, and his oval jaw was radiant with the soft gardenia whiteness of an egg. As he heard the turning knob, St. William swiveled to the mirror to appraise himself, resuming his stance to see at the door, not his old long-suffering maid, but a young woman in a calibrated state of semi-dress. White string bikini loosely tied at the side and an unbuttoned vest in iridescent Indian silk that stopped just below her bosom and continued to her waist in a shower of delicate braided fringes hung with colored buttons. 
Her hair, which was brown and curly, was parted in the middle and tied in a pair of posts. She was holding a bouquet of roses, and in her state of shock, her arm began to fall until the petals brushed the floor. Get away from here, St. William shouted in the local dialect and Koch. The woman leapt backward, and he slammed the door and flung himself across his bed. Over breakfast of jackfish and pounded plantains in a little room beside the kitchen, Estrella the maid told St. William that the woman was a paying guest who had arrived the night before. An American with a New York address who was a lover of the man who had arrived at dawn that morning, hours after he had been expected. The man was short and slim, described Estrella, and judging from his face and arms, possessed a body that was tightly muscled. His, arm resembled, his hair resembled an explosion, and his voice was keen in pitch and edged with danger, like a file against a blade of a machete. The woman's arrival, Estrella gathered, was not in fact a rendezvous, it was an ambush, a surprise, for her voice had been timid when she'd requested to be notified the minute that the man called down for breakfast, her intention being, Estrella thought, to present him with something more delectable than bread to eat. So why did she come to my room, St. William asked, as the clock began to strike again. Like every woman who's ever made that trip, including me, Mr. Rawl, she made a grave mistake. That day, St. William kept watch through his window, which overlooked the pool, a palm-shaded puddle in a square inscribed by the back of the house and three wings of concrete extensions, row upon row of brown doors and glass jalousies and redwood railings stained black with rot and water. How many revolutionaries, he asked himself, had been faced with such a monumental choice. If Toussaint had been faced with a woman like this, would Haiti not be French today? The Spanish influence in San Carlos ran deeper than its name. San Coche was based on Castilian, and Carlitos of all ages kept an almost sanctimonious faith in the virtues of siesta. But at two o'clock, after using the peeling bell to mark the terrace descent to the hour of sleep, St. William did not go to bed. If he did, he knew he would dream of Rebecca, who would admonish him for ignoring the call of duty. And disobeying her, the only person who had ever believed in his greatness would be a monumental act of treason, surpassing in vileness the affair he had pursued with her goddaughter, a teenage seductress who would entertain him by raising her tunic above her breast, crossing her ankles behind her head, and performing tricks of ventriloquy with her lower lips. <laughs> Try it. At 2.30. <laughs> Just as St. William's lids began to droop from habit, the woman appeared on a balcony dressed in a full-length caftan whose neck and cuffs were trimmed with gold. She glanced over her shoulder and slammed the door and tipped upon her platform clogs and slapped it with her palm, shooting a remark whose answer was a burst of automatic laughter. By the pool, she spread a towel on a slatted chaise beneath a palm and lay without moving. To observe her more closely, St. William watched through his binoculars, holding his breath as she withdrew her head and arms into the caftan, reappearing in a bathing suit whose color matched her skin, the evenness evoking for knowledge of her body in the nude. On her inner thigh, there was a mole that made him marvel. It was black and slightly raised, and in its center was a single copper hair. As he looked at her, he heard a rusty hinge and changed his view, and saw the man emerging through the door. He was wearing jeans with bell bottoms and a pair of zippered boots. He was shirtless. In his mouth, there was a conical extravagance of what St. William's hairy nostrils told him was imported Durban poison, and he was holding a guitar, which he carried by the neck slackly, but with need like a drunkard holds a bottle. Baby, the man commanded. The woman did not reply. The man chuckled and disappeared inside the room, returning with a vase of roses. Baby, the man called again. The woman didn't answer. The man began to toss the blooms. As one hit the water, he would toss the next. When the vase was empty, he disappeared inside the room, leaving the door ajar. When the clock struck three, St. William vowed to take bold action. He would send a note to the woman with Estrella, and if the woman did not reply in his favor, he would commence his revolution. And if she did, he wasn't sure what he would do. So he invited her for tea at four o'clock. And when he arrived downstairs in the drawing room, she was sitting on a hassock trimmed in chins. Out of habit, St. William was dressed in a crushed white suit. His shirt was blue to match his eyes. And he walked with a silver-handled cane that he did not need, but which he carried in case she was a kind of woman whose passions would disguise themselves as sorrow. Good day, he said, as he stepped off the stairs. 
Welcome to the owner's tea at the Metropolitan Hotel. It is a long tradition here for us to cater to our guests, especially those that bring to mind the exquisite beauty of our local flora. I'm sorry for a rendezvous this morning. My name is St. William Rawl, he said in a courtly manner, sweeping his hand to invite her to the table, which was set with dull silver and chip porcelain and baskets of freshly baked scones. And my name is Felicia Morris, the woman said. And have you been to the Caribbean before, he asked as she was sitting down. Yes, many times. And what brings you to San Carlos, my love? To be with a man who doesn't want me. That isn't true, St. William thought. Such a man could not exist. He inhaled deeply as he'd often coach young actors and hoisted his chin, stared at her down his nose in a way that he believed communicated power, and as he appraised her, she whispered that his nostrils were clumped with boogers. My goodness, she said, how can you breathe? Before St. William could recover from the shock of her response, she was standing by his side with her elbows on the table, pressing his nose into a napkin and coaxing him to blow. As if summoned by the honking, Estrella entered the room. I'm fine, said William, grunted. Well, you won't be fine, Mr. Raw, when you hear this, she said. Do you know why this damn bell has been ringing all day? A band of idiots from Blackwell tried to start a revolution. They were using the bell as a sign. What kind of idiot would try that in San Carlos? At least, St. William sighed, they had a plan. What's the matter, the woman asked. Ah, some fools try to take over the country and you were their fearless leader? Your friend, he asked to change the subject, what does he do? He's a singer. She told him the name, but he didn't quite recognize it. And what do you do? She slid her hands around her cheeks. Look, she said, I'm feeling very sensitive right now, arousing his appetite for scandal with a sigh that caused her breast to heave. I need someone to talk to. I'm leaving in the morning, so it really doesn't matter. That is true, he said. I left my husband for him, she said, and this is what I get. I saw him throw the flowers in the pool. So you must think I'm an idiot. No, it depends. How long have you known this man? Today makes a week. <laughs> and you followed him here and he doesn't want you. St. William found this fascinating for she did not strike him as a woman who was weak. And although he'd often been guilty of bad judgment, he instinctively believed in his instincts, which were urging him to offer her his help. Would you like me to say a word? To who? To him? About what? The two of you. Remind me of his name again. People call him Bob. I'm going to do it for you. But I'm going to be honest. I'm doing it because I want you, not because I'm good. I watched him throwing the flowers in the pool. I wanted you. He threw you away. Can you allow me to touch you? And you don't have to like it. Just let me. I am old. You could be my father. That is neither yes or no. Can I touch you? Just a little, just your arm. I have to go to my room, she said. And she got up and she left. And St. William nodded and having lost his pride, confided that he hadn't had a drink all day and would be going to his room to be rum suckled. I have failed myself, he thought. And he sat on the edge of his bed and gargled with the rum before he swallowed. And through the window, he watched the man who was sitting on the railing, strumming his guitar and singing softly what sounded from a distance like a psalm, his voice light but keen and edged with a profound sense of longing, as if it emanated from a hole in his heart. And as St. William felt himself being drawn into the mystery of that hole, he put away his bottle and walked to the window and pressed his face against the glass and felt the coolness on his forehead as the rage evaporated out of him into the gash from which that voice had come. That primal place of grief, that wound left behind when the first fruit fell away from the first tree and faced the conflict of survival, the unconquerable knowledge that it too would cause pain when he split the earth to set down his roots. And this is what the man was singing. Until the philosophy that holds one race superior 
and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, then everywhere is war. War until the color of a man's skin is of no more significance than the color of his eyes. Miss a war. And until that ignoble and unhappy regime that hold our brothers in Angola, in Mozambique, South Africa, subhuman bondage, then everywhere is war. War. And as St. William watched, Felicia climbed the stairs. And that man, Bob, yes, of course, that Jamaican fellow, Marley, put down his instrument and draped his arms around her as a bird would fold its wings around its young. And as she opened her mouth and he dipped his head toward her, his hair like an ignited plume, St. William felt his bones reverberating as if they had been struck by a gong. And in a flash of clarity, he understood why she had come this far this quickly to see this man. Because like Steve Biko, and Agostino Neto, and Nelson Mandela, he had the charisma of the revolutionary, the capacity to embrace and rebuke without apology which is rooted in the understanding that life is a cycle of regeneration, and that regeneration is a cycle of pain, and that the great leaders are those who can inspire people to face a coming pain with strength and grace and a vision of life beyond it. Thank you. Shoka. Good evening, Devin. So um, as part of my bid for president, I made it rain, just so you know. <laughs> um, I could go into a lot of uh, introductions, but you know, Colin needs no introductions. Just sign your panties and send them upstage. <laughs> and Father Dawes, you know, um, in summary, Father Dawes has written more books in the time I've known him than I will write till I die, essentially. Over 30 books and counting, you know. And the man's not slowing down. I called him up, I wanted to publish one of his books, you know. Colin knows this, and I said, <laughs> Kwame, you know, me start a new publishing company, and could you send me a manuscript? He said, I send you four, you choose one. <laughs> so, but, um, so all we're gonna do, I think, is just have a conversation, and I'll try and keep it in time, and then open it up for the audience. Um, but we'll try and do it in such a way like, so you can feel like you're eavesdropping on these two gentlemen. My job is just to nudge them. So, Shokano. Oh, by the way, that's the name of the tribe we belong to. <laughs> Shokano means shock and awe. And awe. <laughs> this, is the, this is the chief of the Shokano. <laughs> this is the executioner. <laughs> and I'm the consigliere. <laughs> so, but so, moving straight into this idea of reggae and the idea of a reggae as an aesthetic, just jumping off of Colin's story. Father Dawes, talk about this idea where you take a real person, you fictionalize them, but how in that ties into the idea of what reggae is, both as revolution, but mostly as aesthetic. You know, the, 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 the beautiful thing about that story, and it's part of a, a longer series of linked stories uh, called Passing Through. Um, and, and in it, I mean, Collins, Colin has a number of strengths as a writer, and his capacity to tell that short story is built into his capacity to tell a story, whether he's reading or whether he's writing or so on, just to tell a good story. Um, and, and so that collection is fascinating because of the way that he uses the, 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 the complication of humor, some elements of romance, and then a profound understanding of, 
of, of politics and history, and yet overlaying it is this kind of spiritual explore, exploration. And, and I've, I've written and said this about Colin's work because it, it epitomizes what I like to call the reggae aesthetic, because in the reggae aesthetic, in a single song of Bob Marley or any other reggae artist, we get all those elements, we get the politics, we get the, 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 the sense of social consciousness, um, we, we get um, a spirituality that is quite profound, and we get a tremendous sensuality. I mean, you, you hear a reggae song, you, you dance to the reggae song. So you might be singing war, war, but your hips are doing something else. Um, <laughs> And, and, and I find that's one of the striking things about this story, because in, it, in a sense, there's, there's running through it this sort of subtext of, 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 of sexuality. But when we end the story, we begin to realize the, the place of, of, of an artist like Bob Marley in transforming society and in speaking to society. It's a, it's a beautiful story in a, in a wonderful collection, actually. Thank you. So, so, so uh, Colin, just, just continuing from this. You know, every time, <laughs> every time you say Jamaica, you hear Rasta, right? And, and, and I remember going to Chiang Mai in Thailand and finding a Rasta bar. And there's nothing more disturbing <laughs> than Thai Rastas. <laughs> um, Swedish Rastas, you oh, need Swedish. to meet those. Yeah, no, but you know. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so the thing is that Rasta is, is misunderstood in many ways. Um, because there's Rasta that's spiritual, there's Rasta that's... There's, so talk about this idea of what, of what really Rasta Faranum is, is in terms of the music, but in terms of the notions of a secular Rasta, because that's part of Rasta's power. Right. I think that um, when a religion is really successful is when it becomes secular. Right. I mean, Buddhism is a very good example. Right. Many of us do yoga, many of us um, meditate, many of us um, uh, light incense, right? So we draw upon the secular power of, say, Buddhism. I think that Rasta was really... Uh, a religion created out of a uh, deep concern and a kind of lament for the amnesia of Middle Passage. And I think that the people in Jamaica who had been slaves were trying to uh, connect a bridge to Africa that made sense for them. Mm -hmm. And so what they did, they, they, they um, allowed themselves um, to co construct this mythology um, that connected them to Ethiopia, a mm -hmm. Christian country right. uh, in Africa. Right. right? And, uh, and so the idea then was that there was some sense of hope, but also the idea that a black man could be God. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, what offended most people in Jamaica about Rasta was not so much marijuana smoke, um, wasn't so much um, not combing your hair. It was the idea that a black man could be God. Mm -hmm. Because the truth of the matter is that my, for parents, uh, were not immigrants to Jamaica. They didn't come through immigration. They came through customs. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> they were freight. Free. Right? Yeah. And yeah. moving up from the status of freight, right. they became animals. Right. And, and as they were looking to, to, to sort of come into a full humanity, right. they reached ahead to see themselves in the divine. Right. Right? And I think it was very important to resist that because of what it would mean to a kind of um, psychic strength which is the, the underpinning of a certain kind of dignity that has produced a lot of what we know as a Jamaican character, that kind of uh, uh, dignity in poverty and, 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 and the sense that although you're small, mm. right, that you have the power to resist. Mm. So Rasta then was a kind of um, mystical construction. <laughs> what I find fascinating about Rasta is that when Rasta co-opted reggae, mm -hmm. right, we then had this new religion, right, mm -hmm. like the Mormons, for example. Right. Right. But when you have the Mormon tabernacle choir mm -hmm. versus Bob Marley and the Whalers mm -hmm. and Burning Spear and yeah, Peter right. Tosh, one religion, oh, yeah. Yeah, man. even the Mormons, you can even multiple wives with Mormons and that wasn't enough, right? right? They put that in and said, tell you what, come out our side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Osman brothers. With the Osman brothers, oh, Daniel Osman. One bad apple does not what spoil the whole bunch, whole bunch of girls. <laughs> right? So, um, it is one of the great inventions of the last 150 years. Right. This brand new religion that has pushed its way into, um, uh, into the center of the world and has kind of spread out its, uh, its radiance. 
And so talking about the world and also, so when Kwame, Kwame has uh, you know, these great stories of, Kwame was born in Ghana and, and moved to Jamaica when you were about, what, six? No, no, I was a little older. I was about nine. Nine? nine. Yeah. Mm. And so, but when I came back to Nigeria. So much older, nine. So much nine, older. Nine, but, um, and, and, with Chris. And, you know, <laughs> Chris. <laughs> yeah, man. Kwame is 60 now, so yeah. do the math. Ah, oh, come yeah. on, man. No, I, yeah, look at 65. me. 65. You see so, this face? Mm. It's a 60-year-old face. <laughs> but but in, in that movement, um, I want to talk about mythology a little bit so we mm. can get into worldview. You so, kind of suffer. When, I, when, I, when I, we left the, the Nigeria during the Civil War, we moved to London, and I remember coming back uh, just when I was five or six years old and having someone like, break my head open with a stone to make sure the blood mm -hmm. was red and mm -hmm. not white like my mom's. But, all, but also... The notion that from the movies, everybody who came from foreign yeah. had, was a cowboy. Mm -hmm. And so I used to get beaten up because I didn't have cowboy guns. And so you talk about how you were, there's a great story you tell about, and I want you to go from there into Rasta, mm -hmm. this idea of you, of you and your pet lions. Um, yes. And then from there into mythology and this idea of a worldview and how that is sort of, how reggae then becomes the vocabulary mm -hmm. all over Africa for liberation, essentially. You know, the funny thing is, I'll give you a couple of nicknames that were associated with my family um, and had to do with the idea that we were in Jamaica as Africans. My, my older brother's nickname was Unka, um, which, you know, sounds quite pleasant when you think about it, Unka. Um, but Unka came from a longer phrase called, that goes like this, Unga, Unga, kill, kill, Unga, Unga, kill, kill, um, which is what Africans apparently say um, when they're about to kill you and cook you and eat you. Um, so, so his nickname was Unga. Um, my nickname for a while was Kunju Murunju, uh, which Kwame was not enough. It wasn't exotic enough, so I was <laughs> Kunju uh, Murunju. Um, so, so there were things that I had to deal with, you know, questions about my comfort with shoes and clothes and. Um, if, if, if we, we, we lived both in the house and in the trees, or how did we work out that arrangement? Um, so, 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 so there was a great deal of that, and our way to counteract this was to, 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 to continue the narrative. So, you know, I knew Tarzan, I, you know, I... Um, but you told them you knew Tarzan. No, I told them I knew Tarzan, yeah, I mean... I mean yeah. <laughs> Um, Phantom, you know, the ghost who walks, pal of ours, um, we knew him. And, uh, and we had pet lions at home and, and, and such the like. And, and it was our way to use irony and a kind of vicious sense of superiority to counteract the horrendous um, kind of teasings that we had. But the only people who embraced, at least me, as a young guy, was, was the Rastas. And Rastas wanted to know about Africa. Rastas wanted to know about... Um, about Ghana, what we ate, and so on and so forth. And, and that, that was, 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 was really important to me. Uh, and in a sense, um, I, think that the, I think Rastas brought that effect to, uh, to, Jamaican, to Jamaican society. Um, you know, I don't know, Rastas do not constitute a great percentage of the Jamaican population. That is a true Rasta. But Rastas in the 70s really transformed our language, transformed our ways of looking at, at the world um, in very powerful ways. Because, of, as Colin put it, they, they constructed a bridge to Africa that became a positive bridge rather than a negative bridge um, towards Africa. Mm. Yeah. Well, one of the things, too, um, so when was it? Was it 2005 you had that festival in Houston, right? <laughs> yes. yes. So, yes. so Colin organizes a festival uh, in Houston, and, and we're all invited. And he invites Muta Baruka. I don't know if you know Muta Baruka, the famous reggae musician. So Muta's late. Muta's late. I'm sitting with Colin. Muta Baruka calls. Colin, them hold me upon immigration. <laughs> so, so, so Colin says, "Are you uh, wearing a robe?" Muta <laughs> says. Yes. <laughs> Are you not wearing shoes? Muta <laughs> says, yes. <laughs> You're dressed down to your leg, huh? <laughs> yes. You're wearing a turban? Yes. <laughs> Make them hold you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's so I want to bring this back also, not just to, to that, but this idea of landscape. So landscape is huge, not only in, in the literature we're talking about, in the, the, as, uh, but also in terms of Jamaica itself. 
slave revolts, so you have the Maroons going to the mountain. And this is essentially what Rasta does. They go to the mountain, both metaphorically and otherwise. But the pre so the people who, re who reacted mostly to Rastafarians were middle class Jamaicans, right? Negatively, so, yeah. Basically, and there was a lot of class people too. Right, yeah. and, they, and they got arrested and persecuted. Yes, but I like this idea of the insertion of this. So what is iconic about them is this iconic insertion into the wrong landscape and how all the landscape that is not obvious mm -hmm. and how that begins in its own way to perform this sort of revolution and how that starts to work in the literature and in sort of the, the music in a sort of way. Mm. You wanna, you wanna, do you wanna? Yeah, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Yeah, yeah started, eh? You want me to go Nigerian? No, if, no, if, no, 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 don't go Nigerian on me, please. <laughs> um, Basically, I'm talking about, part of, part of what was interesting about Bob is Bob didn't have to have dreads, right? So dreads become a statement. Right. So Rasta as a statement, if you insert that as an aesthetic into, an, into a landscape that's not expecting it. Great, good. Yeah, man. I think one of the things that, um, that Rasta did and Reggae did, um, aesthetically for writers, was answering the question of voice. Right. I mean, one of the things that uh, Caribbean writers um, before the 1970s had to work out was how to present the Jamaican voice on the page. You look at a writer like Roger Mace, for example, in The Hills Were Joyful Together, he basically used an uh, African-American urban slang, mm -hmm. right? Now this might be a question of uh, Macy's own technical ability. It might also have been, though, a, a real uh, calculation that if he used that voice, then it would be acceptable to publishers in England, because you know, Macy's is being published by Britain, right? Um, reggae freed us up, right, to, to write the Jamaican voice in uh, not just an authentic way, to write the many, but with nuance. You know, I, by the time I came around, I had the confidence that um, people had heard reggae. Mm. I could simply establish that a character was Jamaican and allow them to hear the cadence in the voice. So that's one level of which, uh, sort of aesthetically. The other thing too was the way in which reggae presented a model of narrative that could be simultaneously political mystical, erotic, uh, romantic, comedic, tragic, and philosophical without conflict, right? And I think that, um, that, is, that is one of the, the great uh, contributions of that music uh, to Jamaican and white Caribbean literature. Now, the connection between music and literature is not something unique to us. You know, the great Cuban poet, Nicholas Guillen, mm -hmm. you know, drew so much on the Afro-Cuban son. Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, you know, Amir Baraka drew so much on the blues and on jazz. But I think our situation um, was a little bit different in that if you're an African-American writer or a Cuban writer, you're inheriting a very long domestic tradition. Right. Our literary tradition was very short. Right. Right? And so what... Um, what reggae did, right, um, was um, to, it, it to accidentally mm. question Naipaul's notion of the mimic men, right. that nothing was ever created in the Caribbean. Right. So this music um, creates this um, aesthetic archetype right. that creates its own, uh, um, its own mechanism right. that then unconsciously starts to, to shape the way many writers um, saw the potential of the voice. I mean, someone like Louise Bennett, who is a folklorist and poet, who is lauded by many people in Jamaica because in their notion, she liberated um, Jamaican English, uh, you know, Creole dialect patois because she started writing in it, but she did so for comedic effect. Right. So, in any, so in a sense then, she liberated the language right. to make fun of it. Right. She would go on stage and in very middle class English, right? Here now we're going to have a poem in the Jamaican dialect. Good morning, Miss Matty. <laughs> right. right, right? So reggae gave a dignity to it all. To it all. So segue not still on language and voice. So, so Kwame, you're, you're a poet. But also, so tying in this idea, of, because poetry, a lot of it is about form, it's about control. Mm -hmm. And technology is something you love. But so, so what most people don't know is that reggae is a studio music, right? It doesn't, like jazz, develop yeah. in a live audience. So if you could tie in, in a very short while, mm. voice, language, technology, form, and poetry. Go Kwame. 
In a short while. In a short while. Yeah. Right. I mean, Colin, Colin speaks to that idea of reggae as a studio phenomenon. I mean, it's a very interesting idea because there were not a, many, a lot of, you know, in some music you have a lot of concerts and stage shows and so There were some in reggae, but primarily it's a studio music that is created as much by the artist as it is by the engineer, the, the producer, the person in the studio. Um, and it's a music that is disseminated by, by, by records, right? And, and in a funny kind of way, it, it, it gave a, a certain kind of control and power to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, um, the people who were creating that music because they, they could have ownership of the production of that music and, and, and the transfer, transference of that music. So, so, but within it, within that, that lyric, if, what we've already started to do is to construct this idea of an aesthetic and how that aesthetic can actually feed into a writer. Because when, when Derek Walcott says of a Bob Marley song, No Woman No Cry, or, or the other one that he speaks highly of is um, uh, Redemption Song, and he says that he would like to write a lyric as pure as that, as a poet, he's actually making that connection between um, the popular song that has been created and the poetic expression of that song. And, and, and that's, that's a really important, for me anyway, it, it became something to rest upon as a writer. I don't know, you know, when you're a writer, sort of projecting yourself into, into a world um, of varied styles and varied interests and so on, in a sense you want a grounding that makes you feel that, okay, this is my drum and bass, this is my foundation. This is, it's, it is out of this that I can generate, and I can go anywhere and generate that. And, and for me, reggae became that kind of foundation um, because reggae had demonstrated to me that it could, it could transform anything into reggae. It, this, is, this, is, this is kind of important about foundation. So, so for me, for instance, there were certain tunes that apparently were written by Americans R&B tunes that I was convinced were reggae. were reggae songs that they had messed up and, and you know, um, they had messed up in America because reggae artists reggaefy those songs and those are the ones that we heard and those are the ones that we checked out. Um, but, 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 but it never, but those versions are good versions, they're, but they're not versions that lose their soul or lose some of these dimensions, but they, they are constructed in the phrasing and in the ideas of, of reggae music. So for me as a writer, that kind of foundation becomes, becomes important, in, even in the most basic way of having the confidence to say, um, th this is coming out of something, this is coming out of somewhere. Um, and it, it becomes crucial to make that connection. We'll also talk about phrasing today in the car. We started to talk about some of the phrasing in Mali songs, yeah. right? Arm in arm. Arm in arm with arms, we'll fight this little struggle. We'll arm in about, arms. Yeah, let's talk about that simple construction. It's a great, I mean, this is, you know, this is, this is, um, is Zimbabwe, is it you? Yeah. yeah, in Zimbabwe, he says, so arm in arms with arms, we'll fight this little struggle. And you think how he's put that together. Arm in arm, of course, we know meaning sort of joint together and we'll move together. So there's a sense of unity. But then there's a triple arm. So as we move arm in arm, but we are with arms, which means that this is a revolutionary action with the beauty of, of our unity. And then, and then, and then the, the, the kind of hyperbole, uh, you know, the, 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 what's the opposite of hyperbole? But the underplaying, the understating <laughs> low, low purpley, <laughs> under purpley, <laughs> high purpley, low purpley. <laughs> um, this, by the way, is a very Rasta moment. <laughs> Can we literal bud? <laughs> Just literal. Um, but it's true. it's true. So, so, but, but when he says it's a little trouble, you know the little trouble. What a little trouble is, right? It's a war. It's a whole war. <laughs> So arm in arm with arms will fight this little trouble, you know, and, and, and I don't want, you know, what is it, what's the, the rest of the phrase? So arm in arm with arms will fight this little trouble. But, but, so the construction is, 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 is just really clever and tight and compact that contains a myriad of other things within it. And, and for me, 
I can look to that music, I can look to that artist, I can look to Burning Spear, I can look to culture and find models mm. of, 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 of literary practice, which, which, you know, which are really fascinating. And with that comes, of course, this idea of a, that there's a supreme confidence that the form, because this is the thing, none of that needs to be explained to anyone. It's, yeah. it's assumed that it performs itself. Yeah. And so this confidence, Shogano, mm -hmm. talk about that, man, reggae and confidence. Yeah, it'd be for you know, poets in the Caribbean or poets in small places. Why you talk about us like we're not people? For poets. No. <laughs> no, the thing, the thing is that the, the poets have a different set of expectations about audience, mm -hmm. right? The form itself, right? Um, tends to have fewer uh, dedicated um, fans or readers than, say, uh, nonfiction, prose, or prose fiction. Mm -hmm. So for somebody who is a novelist, the idea that... Um, it, let me back up a little bit. Margaret Atwood, mm -hmm. right? You know, talks about the great how, reggae musician Margaret Atwood. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that great that great Canadian reggae musician <laughs> Margaret Atwood <laughs> talks about how in Canada they wrote short stories so much because there was no idea that they could get published because the publishing industry in Canada, which is a big rich country, right. just wasn't as robust. Right. So imagine in the Caribbean, right? right. right. Um, fewer people, even even um, less um, energy in in the in the publishing in sector publishing, yeah. for a novelist, right? There is always this question of will this endeavor be worth it? Mm -hmm. As you know, half a novel oh. is still not a complete work. That yeah. might be 300 pages, right. Right? right? One poem can be half a page, mm -hmm. right. Right? right? So for the novelist to have the confidence that certain kinds of characters, certain kinds of settings, certain kinds of voices, certain kinds of concerns right. have uh, uh, an international audience, I think it's very important psychologically. Because um, reggae proved something to us, which is that you can have this kind of narrative art that has uh, local relevance mm -hmm. and international reach. Mm -hmm. cool. And the reggae singer wanted, I remember speaking to Johnny Osborne, that great singer, and he said, when he started singing, he just wanted to have a record mm. hung up in the local bar because he didn't have a record player. That's right. After that, he wanted his records to be heard around the world. Mm -hmm. I inherited yeah, that assumption. That ambition. And so for me, I have never, you know, when people ask me if I was ever, if I ever felt that my work would never be published or read, it was no. Yeah. And when I think about it, it came from the psychic confidence of reggae. Yeah. As Bob used to say, remember when um, Barry White was at the height of his career? <laughs> And people always said to Bob Marley, why don't you play music like Barry White, you know, so you can be famous. And he laugh and he say, you know, the people that like Barry White don't like Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. But may never see a person wear a Barry White t-shirt. <laughs> 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 exactly. So, <laughs> what, um, I'm going to just ask you guys one last question and we'll throw it open. Um, what most people don't know about both of you is that you are teachers. In fact, that they, they don't know that you guys used to be my teachers. Um, <laughs> I used to study with these guys. Chris. Yeah. Yes, sir. To say that you were our student <laughs> is so ridiculous. Because okay, you came okay, in, let me one, one second, yeah. you came into the workshops, we basically said, go home and come back with a book. Right, yeah. okay. Right. Right, but, so, but to rephrase, um, I was living in London at the time, and this was a, the big problem was for a lot of writers of color, there were no workshops. And then you and Kwame turned up from the States with a particularly designed series of workshops mm -hmm. called the Afro Style School. Mm -hmm. Just riff on that for a few minutes, and then we can talk to the audience. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, we wore Afro wigs. We, were, we did wear Afros <laughs> and bell bottoms, and that was a prerequisite to get into the court. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you, you know, one of the interesting thing is, it's kind of funny looking back at it, but I, you know, I started, I, I got involved with an organization called Spread the Lake. I mean, Spread the Word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, um, spread, bad spread the bad word. Man. Spread the word. And they were an outfit um, in London who their job was to, to create workshops and to, to give opportunities for writers and so on. And what struck me in meeting writers at the time, meeting African, um, black or people of African heritage, Caribbean heritage in England was. Um, th there was no context in which they could talk about writing and could think about writing. And so I started to do these workshops. 
Um, and then Colin joined me um, uh, to do these workshops. He was working in fiction and I was working in poetry. And really, the truth is that we, we ended up meeting and, and becoming friends with and, and working with um, the writers who have become, you know, the big voices um, who come out of the black British tradition of writing um, today. And what was, what was great about it was that we could talk about um, writing in, in its technical ways and in its fundamental ways, we could, we could, but we could also bring to bear on the discussions, at least in the area of poetry, um, literary traditions that, that, that have come out of the African diaspora and its varied nature. Mm. Because you know, a lot of people were were <laughs> were were creating these ideas of what their work is about. You know, these poets that they you know and and weren't reading, um, thought they were inventing. You know, like spoken word. You know, you know, people thought they were inventing it at that time, and there was none before. And you know, what like, about what about yeah. the African griot ones? And and there were also the um, the the African griots. You know, um, who were people who. In, in the event of being challenged about the quality of their work, we then announce that you don't understand because I'm a griot, you know, that's, you know, my griot voice, right? Um, with no idea of where that and was coming from. what was your from. response? About the griot thing? Mm. Um, I, well, you know, I said, you know, you should really stop giving griots such a bad name because, <laughs> um, you know, really, I mean... But, but it was a great time to talk about writing and to, to really encourage people to write. But also, it was the professionalizing of writing. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people, and maybe many of you are aspiring writers and so on, and you, 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 you say you're writers, but you generally don't write. All right. Which, so can I, which hmm. is usually a problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, usually. So at this point, let's yeah. let the people them ask the question sure. or something. Any questions? Oh, and can you um, and just be direct? Don't do Nigerian questions, you know, where there's like a 20-minute preamble. <laughs> I went to school with your father, my, all that kind of stuff. Okay. My question's very mundane. Um, I'm also a writer, but of non-fiction. And um, I've just finished the first draft of my manuscript. And I was just wondering, how do you deal with the sheer terror of bad reviews? Um, how do you edit your own work when you're sick of it? Um, <laughs> how do you find the courage to promote your book when maybe your mind has moved on to the next book? Mm. So boring, mundane um, questions I'm asking as a writer of other writers. Cool. Gentlemen. Uh, reviews, um, you probably have the book, has book, the book been published yet? Or you're worried about it being reviewed? Oh, okay. Mm. Well, um, worry about whether there will be reviews. Yeah, that's, 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 that's more what no, you should what, be worried about. That's what we all worry about. <laughs> yeah, right? that's what we're worried the about. The space is shrinking, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the, the, the truth is, these are three different stages that you're talking about. The anxiety about reviews probably should come after you finish the book, and then, and then you, you, you deal with it. I mean, it's the condition of writing that we put ourselves out there, and people will say what they want to say about it. Um, I remember the first set of reviews I got for, for, for my first book of poetry, um, which was published in Canada, and it was reviewed by a Canadian fellow who is now my friend. And unfortunately, I think, my reaction was to write him and cuss him and tell him he doesn't know anything about what he's saying. This, this, <laughs> was, this was very petulant and silly on my part. Uh, it worked out well, though, because then he, he wrote back and apologized, and then... <laughs> and then reviewed my other two books very well. So <laughs> this is one approach to dealing with people. The other thing you could do is, you know, you could, you know, get people to go and talk to them. Um, <laughs> and Chris can help you with that. <laughs> so, so, so in dealing with reviews, it's that way. But if you are worried about the next book that you're doing and you, you're tired, well, this is a good problem to have. I mean, if you're already into the next idea, mm then by all means that you should do so. The, only, the last thing I'd say is that on the question of, of how do you help to promote your book, I, I think it's good to treat your books as, as, as you might treat a child. Um, if you've beat brought- them, the, Beat them well and good. Beat them. <laughs> the right and proper way to discipline that child. But if you've brought a child into the world, you probably want to give that child the best shot of, 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 of having a good life out there. 
Um, and so, so if you if you are humble and you don't like to promote yourself, forget yourself and think about the child. <laughs> you understand? It's not about you. It's about the child. It's about the book. Um, Colin, you, Colin, you want to add something to that? Especially yeah, I mean, it, it, part. I mean, I mean, the writing is um, will always involve fear. Um, sometimes you spend a lot of time and you feel it's going well and you read what you've written and it doesn't go so well, but you always have to come back. What sustains me is love, right? That if you love it, you will stay with it through good times and bad. Mm. Well, I'm talking about that. Talk about the way you do rewrites, how you, you take other writers' sentences and break them down. Well, like you, you've mastered every, you have a Kwame Daw sentence. So, yeah. right. Well, I, for, for me, I read a lot. Right, and one of the things in, in doing it, and I'm also somebody who likes um, to do other people's voices, even in conversation. And so there's an ear thing in, 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 in reading sentences. When I, whenever I encounter a sentence I really admire, I will take it and I'll write it out by hand to feel what it feels like to write such uh, a brilliant sentence. And I've done that with, um, I've done that with um, Becoming Abigail. I've done that with She's Gone. I've transcribed all of Kwame Shukfoil by hand, oh. entire volume of poems. Um, <clears throat> but my, for me as a reviser, my best lesson on revision came from a dentist. I was in a dentist chair in New York, a little guy, Elliot Davis, DDS, and we used, I used to lament about the Knicks every time I was in his chair. So he is in my mouth, and he was gonna give me a crown and he said... We're still talking about dentistry. Yes, right? right? <laughs> uh, he said, oh, these goddamn necks. You know what? They're going to fucking lose again. I mean, friggin'. And then he goes, Colin, you know what I'm going to do with your tooth? I'm going to file it all the way below the gum line and build it up again. And I said, oh! I have to write it down. Yeah, man. Because that's what I do with yeah. a passage. I delete everything, take it right down to the two or three sentences and have integrity, build it up again. Now that is a technical understanding, no. but it's also a confidence that comes from practice. That if I wrote three good sentences, yeah, man. given more time I can write three more and three more. And as Naipaul said, you write a novel one good sentence at a time. Yeah, man. Any other questions? Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, good evening. My name is Precious Nala. Uh, I've got a question here. Uh, there's this saying which says, if you want to hide information for a black person, you must hide it in a book. And, um, and, and late, late, uh, lately, there was this gentleman who was sitting there. I forgot his name. He said he's writing it. He's writing the book for himself. So would you, would you guys say that, because you are also writers, would you guys say that you are just hiding information for the black person, for the black people? Because what I've just found here, it's very fascinating, but um, sin seemingly we blacks, we, 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 we don't really go can you, to- Can you ask the question? Is it, is it, are we hiding things in the book? Yes. Yes, we're hiding the marijuana in the book. <laughs> Next question. Sorry, but the question was getting, you were doing the Nigerian thing, you know, I, I can, uh, yes? Okay, thank you for the opportunity. I just want to ask uh, a, relate, a related question. Uh, speaking about Rastas and uh, reggae and Rastafarianism, do you think, uh, some Rastas claim that smoking ganja is a ritual thing with the Rastafarianism, so what do you think about that? Thank you. Well, some Catholics believe that wine and wafers are the blood and body of Christ. Do you believe that? <laughs> and, uh, on that note, you, still, you ready for read? You ready for read? You ready for read? Eh? You ready for read? Um, are we done? Yeah, man. So I, I'm going to ask Kwame to, to read us out some poems from Shukfoil. Shukfoil is uh, a collection based around reggae. Um, they're beautiful poems. And I, have, I, I remember the beautiful inscription. Anyway, I'll Kwame just read does. one poem. I'll take it up there. Um, I thought I'll just read one poem, and um, it's called Rita. 
This is a poem for Rita Marley. I first saw you cooking in the background of a jumpy camera shot while the dread held forth, constructing his facade of enigma, dodging the barbs and darts of Babylon with code, and three times he denied you, called you a sister like Isaac did to Rebecca, leaving her there hanging like that, open season for Ahimelech and the boys. That is what you were, a flower tarnished, just a helping sister, Martha in the kitchen, swollen with child, and who, watching this, would have known of the nights he would crawl into your carbolic womb to become the man-child again, searching for a father who rode off on his white steed and never returned, never sent a message. For years I thought you had lied, for it was our way to believe the patriarchs and who would want to declare the coupling of the downtown dread with the uptown Miss World too sweetly ironic, too much of Hollywood in this sun-drenched, dust-beaten city. Who would let your black face, weighed by the insult, disturb our reverie? I did not believe the rumors, so while the nation crumb grumbled and cussed you out, declared you gold digger and such the like, when he was buried and celebrated in death, and you published the wedding photos, the family snapshot of another time, and when you battled like a higgler for rights and played every dubious game in the book, rough house slander, ratchet smile and all, I called it poetic, the justice you received, for you played the cards right, no bad care drawn in your hands, and you sat quietly in the back room like a nun, bride of Christ and slave to mission. And when you quickly knew other men before the tears could dry from our eyes and made another child in your fertile womb and when your garments of silence were replaced with the garish gold and silver of decadence and when you entered the studio to play rude girl naughty as hell talking about feeling damn high and rolling your backside like a teenager, I had to smile at the poetic meaning of it all for you fasted before this feast. You played the wife of noble character eating the bitter fruit of envy while the dread sought out the light-skinned beauties from London to LA, King Solomon multiplying himself among the concubines. These days I have found a lesson of patience in your clever ways, a picture of fortitude despite the tears. You are a Jamaican woman with the pragmatic walk of a market lady, offering an open bed for his mind-weary nights and an ear for his whispered fears and trepidations and a bag of sand for a body to be beaten, slapped up, kicked and abused. You took it all, like a loan to be paid in full at the right time. I no longer blame you for the rabbit battles raging over the uneasy grave of the Rygin dread, for now I know how little we know of those salad days in a St. Anne's farmer's market, farmer's one-room shack, where you made love like a stirring pot and watched the stars, for they were the only light. What portions you must have made to tie, tie your souls together like this. I simply watch your poetic flight, black sister reaping fruit, for the mother left abandoned with a fair-skinned child. For the slave woman who caressed the heads of some married white master with hopes of finding favor when the days were ripe. All who suck salt and bitter herbs. All who scratch dust, scavenge for love. All who drew bad cards. You have walked the walk well. The pattern is an old one. I know it now. It's your time now, daughter. Ride on, Natty Dread. Ride on, my sister. Ride on. Yeah, Thank you. Mind. <laughs> so, I'm going to ask you about the books. So, um, they, they want to kick us out soon, so the, the last thing, uh, we have some books to give away. I'm going to ask Father Dawes to decide who I get the books. Well, my theory is that we should give it to a very pretty girl. Um, somebody who dress nice. Mm -hmm. With a nice shoe. Nice shoes, yeah. And every night there was a, a young lady who was out there, I keep noticing, dressed nice every single night. Very different garments and things, Indian influence things, you, oh, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know who I'm talking about, no. yeah. No, you don't, no. Well. I was looking at another girl. Oh, so, okay, right. Um, well, there's a young lady that I thought it might be good to just, just give her these books. And um, uh, so maybe Maggie might know who the person is. Right. Ma Ma Maggie? She's there? Come, come, Maggie, come, come, come. <laughs> Those are for you, Maggie. Welcome. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out. Kwame Dawes, Colin Chana, they will be available to sign books upstairs. Peace. One love. It's a Rasta. Okay, on that note, we're going to conclude the 15th time of the Writer Festival. Thank you to all our writers, and we hope to see you, lovely people, next year for the 16th edition of this festival. For those film lovers and soon to be film lovers, do not forget the 33rd Durban International Film Festival, which runs from the 19th to the 29th of July. Good night, travel safe, and God bless. <laughs>